Throughout human history, there's been a title assigned to a few rulers, a few kings. I think probably the first one, at least recorded, would be Cyrus II, or otherwise known as Cyrus the Great. He was referred to in the book of Ezra, and he bore an interesting title. This title I'd like for us to quickly discuss this afternoon. Um, King Artaxerxes bore it as well, as was Darius the Great, as well as no doubt many others. But I think in the research I've done, Cyrus was the first one to actually have this title assigned to him or give it to himself. In Persian, the term She meant king. Well, Cyrus employed this term because he was the king. Well, later on, because of the history of the nation, he later would also have the term Shean She, which means king of kings. Well, this is primarily due to the fact that ancient Persia conquered many other nations. Well, they were, I guess you could say, a gracious ruling country because they allowed those rulers that already ruled those countries to remain in power as long as that king as well as their subjects remained loyal and pledged allegiance to Persia. And of course if they paid their taxes. That's always important. Thus the ruler over other rulers or the rule over other countries and rulers increased. And as such the Persian ruler became known as the king of other kings. Hence the name. Shayan Shay. Now we see in the Old Testament this term, is, this title is employed three different times. As we said in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 12, Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 7, and Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. And each time the ruler is referred to as a king of kings for this particular reason. You think of Daniel, they're, they're dealing with Babylonian captivity. As we stated, those rulers most of the time were allowed to rule, but as long as they aligned themselves with Persia. Now while this title was given to mere mortals, we know of only one who can properly have this title applied to, and that is Jesus the Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. He alone has what there says immortality. Honor and power should be given to him. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. After all, he has been given power and dominion over all things on the earth. Christ offers this immortality through the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. As well as, well as Romans chapter 1, verse 16. We know from the book of Revelation, as well as many other places, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, that the forces of evil always raise war with him. The Lamb of God, however, will be victorious when this world is over. We are amenable to his law. That is the law of Christ. There in Revelation chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, there the apostle John pins, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the, fire, of, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now though we have the option now, of submitting our will to Christ's, we can choose to submit our will to His in this life before it's too late. We can serve Him with the very lives that we have. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. It was there said of Paul that he had kept the course. He had fought a good fight. Can the same be said about us? Or are we choosing to live in rebellion to God? Are we members of that force of evil making war with the Lamb of God? 
Now, when this life is over, there will be no option. We have the chance now to obey God, to obey the will of Christ. Once we close our eyes in death, our life in the flesh will be no more. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul there again writes, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, why does this matter? Well, as we said, we can use our lives in service to God while we're here in the flesh, or we can choose to rebel against His will. But there will come a time where we don't have that choice. But every single knee will bow. You think of all those atheists who have denounced God and attempted to prove Him to not exist. Even those people will be bowing the knee to God Almighty, to Christ. They will even be confessing Him as Lord and Savior. We have the option to do that now, today as we live in the flesh. To submit our will to His, therefore being obedient to His will and gaining heaven as our eternal home. One day when this life is over. Now, we wanted to offer the invitation to any of those this afternoon who might not have put on Christ as of yet. Why not? What's stopping you from obeying your Savior? Well, we pray that that would be removed from you. And if, that, if now is that time, then obey the gospel. Be baptized for the mission of your sins. However, if you are an erring child of God, you've allowed sin back into your life, repentance and prayer will restore you into a correct relationship with God the Father. Whatever the need may be, please let it be known as together we stand and sing.